Okay, I only have 15 slides. That's one in five. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, I should say at the outset that uh, my research area is in uh, really heat transfer and thermodynamics. And so on a daily basis, I do a really uh, computational and uh, experimental analysis of solar thermal systems, which is quite a, quite a distance from the topic of peak oil, actually. Uh, but as was just announced, I teach a course in energy and the environment in the environmental science and applied uh, and science program. Keep it short. Uh, and so based on this background, I was asked to give a, 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 an overview of what energy systems might look like as we tra transition away from uh, conventional oil. Uh, it's interesting that my first exposure to this topic was actually in 1976. I was thinking back as I was preparing this. In grade 11 geography, I, I did my term paper on oil scarcity. And uh, of course, this was uh, just in the wake of the uh, 1973 oil embargo. And so there was a lot of interest in oil, oil scarcity at the time. I think the big difference between 1976 and now, I mean, besides the fact that the predictions have gotten a lot better uh, and it's become less of a, a, a fringe issue, is the big chain game changer is climate change. And I think the theme of my talk is really that climate change makes dealing with the issues of peak oil that much harder. Uh, that, if we'd know, if we, that really wasn't on, on uh, an issue in, in 76, at least not as much. This is a, an overview of my talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about peak oil, but not so much, because we've heard a lot about it. But I want to, do want to say what I think about it and sort of set some uh, uh, terms of reference. Then I'm going to describe six, I mean, there's many more ways to go, but I'm going to describe, describe six energy pathways and uh, talk about which I think are more likely and which are more desirable. And indeed, I have a worry that the, the uh, likely and the desirable might be somewhat misaligned and the desirable from an environmental perspective. And then I'll step into the area of opinion, strongly opinion and speculation uh, in, in, in the summer. This has already been talked about, but I'll present it in a slightly different way. Uh, world oil production is 84 million barrels a day. And a typical uh, uh, super tanker, several hundred uh, meters long, would carry around 2 million barrels of oil, typically. So you're talking, just to put it in, uh, you know, the number's hard to get a grip on. It, you're talking about 30 of these super tankers a day. And if you multiply that by 365, you get 31 billion barrels of oil. And that production rate's been surprisingly steady uh, for the past five years. And the question is, of course, are we uh, reaching a peak? I'm not going to address the issue of, of when the peak will happen, because uh, uh, I think Jonathan asked me just to sort of not talk too much about that issue and talk more about energy pathways. Uh, but I do want to say a little bit, uh, that of course, we've already heard this this morning, we're not running out of oil nor fossil fuels. There's lots of those and uh, lots available. But I would fit more with what uh, uh, was said this morning, that it's really a peak in the rate of production of conventional oil. And as uh, sort of renowned geologist uh, David Hughes likes to talk about, he likes to talk about ge we're running into geological limitations in terms of the rate at which we can extract uh, this oil. And so we're going to run into a situation where we have, a, uh, uh, as Richard spoke about, a, a growing demand chasing a shrinking supply. Uh, and that gap has to be filled by substitutes. And that's what I'm going to talk about. And some of what I'm saying here is, of course, redundant to what was already talked about this morning. Uh, I want to emphasize, before I talk about substitutes, that the problem is really a liquid fuel problem. Uh, not, I mean, in the 70s it was called an energy crisis, but it was really a liquid fuel problem. We're going to be sh have a shortage of high-density, portable liquid fuels that we can uh, use for transportation. And as Richard brought up, it's, it's mainly, I see it as mainly a transportation sector issue, those non uh, uh, fuel uses of oil, uh, they're relatively small and they tend to be in high value added products. I don't want to get into that. But, and it's, I think it's interesting that most renewable technologies don't produce liquid fuels uh, directly, uh, with the notable exception, of course, of biofuels. Uh, when oil, conventional oil does peak, we are going to see a demand side response and a supply side response. And some of these issues have been talked about. We're going to see, yeah, we saw it in, in 2008, when oil hit about $140 a barrel, we saw 
uh, people weren't so enamored with their SUVs anymore, and we're going to see all sorts of things, uh, telecommuting and improved mass transit. Uh, but what I want to talk about more is the, the, the uh, supply side of it. And uh, that transition, which depending on how fast conventional production drops off, uh, is going to involve a, a broad suite of options. Now, I'm going to start with, a th I got three undesirable options, and uh, uh, I think being Canadians, we're all familiar, quite familiar with the tar sands. And uh, I think our reliance on heavy and extra heavy oils is, is almost certainly going to increase. Um, it's been called a dangerous abundance of unconventional oil, and I'll get to that a little bit more. In addition to the tar sands, we have the Orinoco, Orinoco oil belt in Venezuela, which in 2009, the U.S. Geological Survey reassessed at 500 billion barrels of oil. That's, uh, those are proof reserves that we can obtain with uh, conventional uh, existing technologies. Uh, that's more oil than uh, the proof reserves of uh, Saudi Arabia. Although that's not really, um, that's really an apples and oranges comparison because this heavy, heavy uh, oil is difficult to get at and uh, more difficult to refine. Uh, and you need to require enhanced, basically enhanced oil recovery techniques, directional drilling, injection of steam, that sort of thing. And as a result, you have a, a poor energy return on investment. Conventional oil in its primary phase uh, is around 100 to 1. I mean, that's the, about as good as it can get. Uh, 100 units of energy out for one unit of energy in. And then, but when you look at something like steam-assisted gravity drain, drainage, which is an in situ technique, used in the tar sands, you, you can get as low as uh, 3 to 1. And so you have higher carbon intensities, and these can be mitigated by CCS, carbon capture and storage, but only partly, and I'm going to come to that issue more in my talk. Uh, and of course there are other environmental issues, and I don't want to turn this as a rant against tar sands, uh, but you can't help thinking about ripping up uh, large tracts of boreal forest and tailing ponds and the like. Uh, but if you put those issues aside, it's already been pointed out that there are, these are capital-intensive projects and uh, there are deliverability issues in terms of getting enough production to meet, to meet the dropping uh, uh, production of conventional oil. But we are already going down that path and I think it is an area for concern. The next undesirable option that I'm going to describe is perhaps less known and I, I think it's something that you're going to see developed especially in the United States uh, which has large coal reserves and on a worldwide basis uh, coal is uh, quite cheap. It only costs about ten dollars of coal uh, to make a barrel of synthetic fuel. So what you're doing here is taking coal, gasifying it, and then there's very well established processes. This is not new technology to liquefy it into synthetic gasoline, diesel, uh, jet fuel and the like. In fact, South Africa is doing that right now with, for, for a significant chunk of their gasoline production. This last couple of points I have, I'm trying to point to it down here, are quite interesting. That The U.S. military, knew, uh, it's probably not surprising, that they're quite concerned about their uh, energy security being reliant upon foreign oil. And in, uh, uh, in 2008, they, uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, at the request of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, permits were issued for a coal to lipids plant, quite substantial coal to lipids plant for producing uh, diesel and jet fuel, and uh, these have been tested in, 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 uh, uh, by the U.S. Air Force and aircraft. And prior to the downturn in the economy in 2008, there was another very large coal, coal to uh, liquids plant planned in Montana, which was uh, subsequently canceled. So, uh, of course, not the least the, I mean, environmental impact of this process is, can be quite bad, not the least of which is carbon emissions, which can be substantial. Now, most of the plants, uh, the ones that I've heard of, have plans for uh, CCS, but there are limits to that, and I'll come to that. Of course, there's the capital investment. Another 